A blessed Palm Sunday to you all. I'm Pastor Tom Rogers, serving now as the vacancy pastor of St. Paul Lutheran Church on the corner of Port and Burgundy in the city of New Orleans, Louisiana. Again, we welcome you all to our worship service. This is our step into Holy Week. We'll be preparing our hearts uh, for this most important week as well. And we begin our worship as we always do in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. On that first Palm Sunday, there were some words spoken. I'm sure that some of the words I'm about to speak and invite you to listen intently to were the same words that the children and others spoke that first Palm Sunday. Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the king of Israel. Hosanna in the highest. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Behold, your king comes to you, O Zion. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea. Return to your fortress, O prisoners of hope. Even now I announce that I will restore twice as much to you. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, during Lent, we have prepared in quiet worship and devotion for the celebration of our Lord's death and resurrection. Today, we come together to begin this solemn celebration in union with the whole church throughout the world. Christ enters his own city to complete his work as our Savior, to suffer to die, and to rise again. Let us go with him by faith in love, so that with him in his sufferings we are united, so that we may be united also in his risen life. We want to call attention to one particular reading on this Palm Sunday, a reading that speaks to the very heart of Jesus, a heart that we all hope that we can also emulate. From Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. This is the word of the Lord. temple the lovely anthem rings 
the simplest and the best. Hosanna in the highest, that ancient song we sing, for Christ is our Redeemer, the Lord of heaven our King. Oh, may we ever praise Him with heart and life and voice, and in His blissful presence eternally. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you this day from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. I, I feel like I should apologize for the singing, but we thought maybe that would be better than just um, music alone. Maybe not. But it's time to talk about Jesus and that trip that he took on Palm Sunday so long ago. Maybe to begin, I could share with you that this last Christmas, I got one of those wonderful watches, uh, the kind that is capable of telling you what you've done in terms of activity in a given day. It can tell you how long you've done certain things. It can tell you how far you've done certain things, but it can't tell you what you've accomplished during that day. Each and every person in our life now, especially here in America, is encouraged to be active, to just stand up if that's all that you can do, to breathe if that's the best you can do. And we have now our devices, our watches, that can tell us where we are along the way. That's right, you go ahead and check your watch, see how far you've done uh, so far today already. In fact, um, being active is a very big part of the life of people in the United States of America, and so is walking. There are places where people gather, even pay money, to walk um, 5K or 10K. Um, and then there are those that love to run. They run for their health sake. And uh, the granddaddy of the, that walk, or run rather, seems to be the marathon, uh, where folks get together and run for 26 miles and some, some feet. Um, <laughs> and then um, maybe they collapse or whatever. But they, they take that very seriously. Jesus took walking very seriously too. He, his whole life was a walk. It began in Bethlehem. And from there, he and his parents walked all the way to Egypt. And when God said so, they walked all the way back home. When Jesus began his public walk at age 30, he decided, like many others, that he didn't want to walk alone. And so he gathered to himself 12 people who would walk with him for three years. They walked with him wherever he went. And what he discovered on his walk was that some of the people he passed by loved him. They shouted words of blessing to him. And others didn't know him and didn't understand him. They listened as he taught, and he hoped and prayed that as he taught, they would come to understand him and his mission and believe that he was walking for them. But then there were others. They seemed to be able to find groups along the way, people that despised him, the way he lived his life, the claims he made about himself, the things he did for his father and his father's children irritated them. They just couldn't understand why he thought he was better than them. That's the way they thought about him. So much so that they had disregarded the teachings that they had followed, even though they were given to them by Moses. 
they hurled insults and sometimes stones at Jesus as he made his walk. Jesus didn't spend much time in any given day looking down at his watch to see what he had accomplished. Now, Jesus determined that his walk was successful if blind people could now see, if lame people could now walk along with him, if those who were hopeless suddenly find joy in life and are eager to live now and with him in heaven. You see, Jesus' walk was not for himself. Jesus' walk was for you and for me, for all of us whose path in life is crooked, who sin each and every day. Jesus knows that the wages of sin is death, and so he took a lifelong walk in order to take our sentence of death upon himself. Along Jesus' way, particularly during Holy Week, he ran into some real obstacles. You see, some people run to a barbecue when the race is all over. Some people run and enjoy a cold drink after everything is over. They generally run to a park, a well-manicured place that's very pretty, all in keeping with their great accomplishment that day. But Jesus walked to a rock called Golgotha. He ran to a cross. He ran to the cross, and when he saw it for the first time, it looked like this just this vertical piece in the ground. The Romans didn't want to have to dig a hole for every vertical and horizontal cross carried up that road. And so they permanently put the vertical piece in the ground. And what Jesus came up with was this horizontal piece. When his walk was almost over, he saw that he had done it all to come to a cross. Jesus ran to a cross that isn't just wonderful to look at or to wear around our necks. He ran to a cross where men held him down and nailed his hands to the horizontal piece and nailed his feet to the vertical piece and let him hang there. As he hung there, he realized that it was hard to breathe. Try putting your hands and the balls of your feet against a wall and see how easy it is for you to breathe. The only way a person crucified can breathe is by pushing down on their legs so that their chest can come up and they can take a hard breath. There are people all over our world who are having trouble breathing right now because of this virus. Jesus had the same thing, but it wasn't a virus that caused him to barely be able to breathe. It was your sin and my sin that caused him all that pain. But he's not yet. He's not yet to the end of his road, to the end of his race. No, he runs to some rulers, people who are supposed to be able to make good decisions for God's people living in God's world. But as is too often the case, the rulers that Jesus ran into were wicked people, mean people, people who were jealous of Jesus. And so they struck him. They spit on him. They gave him a purple garment, the color of kings, placed it around his shoulders, and then began to ask if he was truly the king of Israel. 
What a horrible thing to have to run by and look at. Think how horrible it was to have to run there and be treated like that. He was on that cross for three hours. That's enough to make anyone running or walking thirsty. And so Jesus, already in pain, his legs probably crying out for the many times he tried to take a breath, said, I thirst. And so somebody took a sponge and they put it in, of all things, vinegar. And they gave that to him. It didn't taste at all like Gatorade or like cold water. They couldn't fit it into a bottle. And so all he got was this strange piece of cloth that might have brought some relief to his tongue, to his mouth in general. What a horrible thing to run to. And if that in itself weren't enough, he had to think back on how he got this place in the first place. And what he remembered was that one of the people he had chosen to walk with, he had spent hours with, decided that he was not the Messiah and so he would be turned in, turned in by Judas for 30 pieces of silver that may have found their way into a compartment like this. They say people think about lots of things while they're running. Just think, Jesus may have had to think about how a friend, a friend decided to turn him in to initiate all this pain and all this trouble. And if that weren't enough, Jesus was probably given a wonderful tunic. We know it was wonderful because Scripture says it was all in one piece. It wasn't a bunch of pieces of cloth all tied together just to keep a man warm. No, it was something he could be proud of. Proud of, I'm sure, as a gift. And so the folks on crucifixion detail, those members of the army whose job was to kill people, see that some of the things that Jesus left behind was this beautiful tunic. And anybody on crucifixion detail had the right to take what they wanted to take from the man who's being crucified. But they decide they don't want to divide it. And so... They would gamble to see who got Jesus' beautiful tunic. Imagine dying for those very people, doing the greatest act of love that ever has been seen, while these men take your clothing. When your mother is right there and could have easily taken it, as a remembrance for herself. There is no such love in Jerusalem that day. These men took it for themselves. How often do we take things for granted? We also take things for ourselves, do things that we know disappoint our Savior, but choose to do them anyway before that killed him. This activity broke his heart. And we do the same day after day, which is why Jesus needed to go all the way to the end of his road, which was a grave. He knew no sin. He had never broken the heart of his father. His father was delighted in him and everything that he did and everything that he said and he said and did those things for us because we seldom do things for God. And if we do, it's not always with the heart that God expects. We may do it 
just to get it over with or to make someone else happy. Jesus died for our attitudes, our mentalities, the condition of our hearts and minds, so that on the third day, rising from the dead, he could give new life, new spirit, new heart, new mind to you and to me. He was dead. Just to make sure he would be dead, they took their sticks and broke his legs. A man with broken legs can't push down in order to get a breath. He would suffocate in no time. Jesus was dead and they put him in a grave and the grave was covered by a rock, a rock that was in so tight that only angels could break it away. And so they did on the third day, even as Jesus had promised. Now his race is over. Now he's taken the finish line and moved it all the way up to heaven. And he's redirected our routes too, so that we get to go past the cross, past the shame, past the pain, straight to heaven. And Jesus is there applauding. Or as John says in his revelation, he comes to each walker, each runner, like you and me, and wipes every tear out of our eyes. We'll never cry again. We no longer need these ducks, which we so often use. Instead, Jesus says to us, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Because Jesus finished this race. Our race is over. We've completed it by his grace. We've received that grace over and over again. It fills our hearts with joy. It gives us an enthusiasm that we've never known before. It gives us the kind of motivation that might want to make us keep walking, just like he did so long ago. Walk with him all the way to heaven. May Jesus bless your journey. In his name, amen. We indeed have a merciful God who loves to watch us walk and loves to hear us talk, especially to him in prayer. And so let's pray together. O Lord, have mercy. O Christ, have mercy. O Lord, have mercy. From all sin, from all error, from all evil, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, good Lord, deliver us. In all time of tribulation, in all time of our prosperity, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, help us, good Lord, to raise those who fall and to strengthen those who stand, to comfort and help the weak-hearted and the distressed, we implore you to hear us, good Lord, to strengthen and keep all sick persons and young children, to free those in bondage, especially now, O oh Lord, to the COVID-19 virus, and to have mercy on us all, we implore you to hear us, good Lord, for forgiveness for the many times we have denied Jesus. O oh Lord, have mercy for grace to seek out those habits of sin which mean spiritual death, and by prayer, self-discipline, and the Holy Spirit to overcome them, Lord, have mercy on us. For Christian people, that through the suffering of disunity, there may grow a rich union in Christ, Lord, 
have mercy. For those who make laws, interpret them and administer them, that our common life may be ordered in justice and mercy. Let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For those in the darkness and agony of isolation, especially now those, O oh Lord, who endure their illness in hospitals at home, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would comfort them with your own presence and give them your peace. For all who are in trouble, want, especially now, O oh Lord, sickness and adversity, have mercy upon them. And for those who are tempted to give up the way of the cross, finally, that we, with those who have died in faith, may find mercy in the day of Christ. O oh Lord, hear us. And now, Lord, remember each of us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. May Christ crucified draw you to himself to find in him a sure ground for faith, a firm support for hope, and the assurance of sins forgiven. May the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. a good thing to gather together and worship with one another even when we can't see one another it's our prayer that you're all doing well uh, that your families are healthy and strong um, and our prayer is also that we might uh, be reunited again very soon until that day then go in peace serve the lord and thanks be to god amen